In today's video, we're going to prove a continued fraction relation, which is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus dot 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 equals to the square root of 2. So first of all, why even bother? A bit of a motivation for today's task. This video is a follow-up to my previous video, This is Not Mathematics. Link in the video description, and hence the title of today's video. And the second, and a much more important motivation, is that this problem we're going to solve today can be seen as a trailer to the extremely powerful Banach fixed point theorem. This theorem is widely used in many branches of applied mathematics, such as differential equations, economics, and machine learning. The theorem is named after the famous Polish mathematician Stefan Banach, shown in the picture on the right. So this is our plan of attack. First, we're going to assign a precise meaning to our main result. And second, to make the proof easier to understand, we will do some visual exploration using decimals. And the third part is called machinery, which is going to be rather formal and abstract. This contains the concepts and the results necessary to understand our main proof. And finally, the actual proof itself. Let's go. So first, let's assign a meaning to the statement. Let's first explore with finite continued fractions. Let's first start with a continued fraction that only has 1, 2 in its denominator, which is just 1 plus 1 half. Let's call this number x1. The second continued fraction has two twos in the denominator of its fractional part. Notice, by a slight algebraic manipulation, we can express x2 in terms of x1. That is, by breaking the first two in the denominator as 1 plus 1, we can write x2 equals to 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 plus 1 half. But 1 plus 1 over 1 half is just x1. So therefore, x2 is 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x1. Moving on to the third continued fraction. There are three twos in the denominator. Again, let's apply our earlier trick by breaking up the first two into 1 plus 1. This way we can see that what goes after the 1 plus sign is exactly the x2 we just defined. And as a result, x3 is equal to 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x2. Clearly we can see a pattern among these finite continued fractions. That is, the next term is just 1 plus 1 over 1 plus the previous term. And in fact, we can do this for x1 as well. Because if we define x0 to be 1, then x1, which is 1 plus 1 half, is just the same as 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x0. So now we're ready to formulate our main claim. So here we define a sequence by a recursive relation. So then we're going to write the relation in a more compact form by defining the function f of x. So f of x is 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x. This is motivated by the right-hand side of the recursive relation. So the right-hand side is just f of xm minus 1, and therefore xn is equal to f of xm minus 1. So now we can interpret the statement as our main claim, which is stated as follows. That is, the limit of the sequence xn, which we define by a recursive relation, is equal to the square root of 2. To prove this main claim, we'll need some fairly abstract machinery. But first, let's do some visualization, in particular, graphically, how this sequence xn is generated. So first, graph the function f of x. Notice that when x is positive, f of x is also positive. And since the initial value of our sequence is 1, we know that the sequence xn is always going to be positive. So we can restrict ourselves in the first quadrant. Now we're going to add the line y equals to x on the graph. Right now, my mouse is pointing at the number 1 on the x-axis, the initial value of the sequence. We know the recursive relation says xn is equal to f of xn minus 1. So in order to get the next number of the sequence, we just need to plug in the value 1 into the function. This purple vector is the visualization of that computation. Therefore, the y-coordinate of the tip of the vector is exactly x1. Let's label the tip of the vector by n equals 1. 
So now let's represent x2 on the graph. We know that x2 is f of x1. I need a graphical representation to put x1 on the horizontal axis. This is accomplished by the line y equals x. If we translate the point n equals 1 horizontally to the right until it hits the line y equals x, then we know the translated point will have x coordinate of x1. This is shown by the second vector. So now the number x1 is represented horizontally. We can represent x2, which is equal to f of x1. This is done by the third vector. The tip of the third vector has y coordinate of x2. So let's label this point by n equals 2. So just using the same principles earlier, the tip of the point n equals 3 has y coordinate x3. Similarly, we can get the next number in the sequence, x4. So this is x4. Zooming a bit out, we see a pattern among these iterations. As n increases, the iterations gets arbitrarily close to the intersection of y equals x and the graph of the function f of x. The reason that iterations behave this way is due to the shape of the function. If we look at consecutive iterations, say for example n equals 1 and n equals 2, the horizontal separation is greater than the vertical separation. And the same is true for n equals to 2 compared with n equals 3. The horizontal separation is greater than the vertical separation. The same is true for n equals 3 and n equals 4. This can only happen if the function f of x does not increase or decrease too rapidly. And when a function behaves this way, a sequence generated in this manner will always converge. And that is the main idea of contraction mapping theorem. And we're now ready to formalize things. Because our main claim says the limit of xn equals the square root of 2, first we need to define what we mean by limits. Consider a sequence of real numbers, x0, x1, x2, and so on, which can be abbreviated as xn, n goes from 0 to infinity, or simply just xn. And also we let l to be a real number. By xn converges to l, or l is the limit of xn, we mean that for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a non-negative integer capital N such that the absolute value of x little n minus L is less than epsilon for every integer little n greater or equal to big N. This is a rather involved definition. The main idea of this definition is error control. By saying xn converges to L, in plain English, we mean that xn and L can get arbitrarily close, that is, as close as we wish, provided little n is large enough. Symbolically, this can be abbreviated into a statement with quantifiers, which reads, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n in the set of non-negative integers, such that if the integer little n is greater or equal to n, xn minus l absolute value is less than epsilon. And here we have our notations. xn followed by a right arrow followed by l reads xn converges to l, which is equivalent to the limit notation, which says the limit of xn is l. And here is a schematic diagram for the definition of limits. So the numbers in the sequence xn are represented in the scatter plot. The horizontal line with height s is the limit of xn. The definition says, given any error tolerance represented by the positive number epsilon naught, there exists a threshold capital N naught, so that every point that comes after N naught falls within the tunnel with radius epsilon naught in this diagram. And all those points are painted as green dots. So now let's suppose we make the error tolerance a bit smaller. So the red tunnel was our previous error tolerance. The purple tunnel is the new error tolerance. They are both symmetric with respect to the horizontal line S, the limit of the sequence Xn. And as we can see, for this new, narrower tunnel, there exists another threshold labeled as N1. So every point that comes after big N1 will fall into the new tunnel. 
It doesn't matter how small the error tolerance is, you can always find such threshold. In this diagram, all the points with little n greater or equal to n1 are painted as white dots. The idea is they all lie within the pink arrow tunnel. As a historical note, the modern definition of limit, sometimes named as the epsilon big N definition, is due to these two mathematicians, Bernard Bolzano and Carl Wallstrass. The notion of limits is of central importance to the foundations of calculus. Now let's define the notion of contractions. Definition. By a contraction, we mean a function g closed interval a to b to itself, that for some constant l, which is greater or equal to 0 and strictly less than 1, that the absolute value of g of x minus g of y is less than or equal to y times the absolute value of x minus y. And this is true for all x, y in the interval a to b. So the idea of the contraction is that the size of the rise, which is the left-hand side of the inequality, is less than or equal to the size of the run times some shrinkage factor. So the next proposition helps us identify contractions under certain situations. It says if a function g that maps from the closed interval ab into itself is continuously differentiable on ab, with the absolute value of g prime of x, that is the derivative of g, strictly less than 1 for every x in ab. Then we can conclude that g is a contraction with the shrinkage factor l equals to the maximum of g prime absolute value for x in ab. When this proposition is applicable, we can easily show a function is contraction because you just need to verify two things that is, g maps a closed interval into itself, as well as the absolute value of the derivative is strictly less than 1. However, here there is a technical note, because ordinarily, in order to define a derivative, the point x needs to be an interior point of the domain. However, here the domain is a closed interval, that means the endpoint a and b are not interior points. So we need to define the derivatives at the endpoints as well, the derivatives at the endpoints AB are interpreted as one-sided derivatives. So this is our remark. The derivatives at the endpoints are understood as one-sided derivatives. Uh, for example, f prime of A is interpreted as the limit of the usual difference quotient that we use to define derivatives when x approaches A plus. So that means in this one-sided limit expression, x approaches a from its right side. And so lastly, we have a concept called a fixed point of a function. This is just the solution to the equation x equals to gx. Remember, in our visualization, the fixed point corresponds to the intersection of the graph of the function f of x, this blue curve here, and as well as the straight line y equals x. So at this point, the function value equals to the value of the input. Here comes the big result, the real high point of this video. It is called the Banach fixed point theorem, also known as contraction mapping principle. It says, suppose that g from the closed interval ab into itself is a contraction. Then there is a unique fixed point x star to g. So the first part asserts the existence and uniqueness of a fixed point. And the second part says, the sequence xn defined by xn plus 1 equals to g of xn converges to x star, that is the fixed point, for any starting value x naught in AB. So the second part is essentially an algorithm to approximately solve for the unique fixed point x star with arbitrary precision. This is what Banach fixed point theorem is about. Here we only presented a closed interval version. But in general, this closed interval AB can be replaced by a complete metric space, which is a much more general and flexible setting, and one of the reasons that Banach fixed point theorem is so widely applied. As a historical note, this result is mainly due to these two mathematicians. The person on the left is the French mathematician Charles Emile Picard. It was Picard who first used the fixed point iteration scheme to prove existence and uniqueness to the solution of ordinary differential equations. 
and more specifically initial value problems. And the person on the right is the Polish mathematician Stefan Banach, one of the founders of the modern discipline of functional analysis. Aside from Banach fixed point theorem, there are also several important concepts and results that are named after him. We are finally ready to get to the proof of the main claim. As you will see, once we have those machinery at our disposal, the proof is rather trivial. That does not mean this is an uninteresting result. Because we planted the seeds earlier, and now it's time to reap the fruits of our labor. So this is our goal. We need to show that a sequence generated in the following manner has limit square root of 2. We'll first need to verify that this function f of x is a contraction. However, bear in mind that in the definition of the sequence, f of x does not have a domain explicitly written. In order to be a contraction, f of x has to map a closed interval into itself. When it comes to applying the Banach fixed point theorem, usually it takes a fair amount of rough work to find out the closed interval. Let's once again return to our graph and see why the interval 1, 2 would work. As you can see here, if I restrict x to be in 1 to 2, the corresponding output is also a subset of 1 to 2. It does not have to be the entirety of our 1 to 2, it just needs to be a subset of it. So therefore, by the proposition, it suffices to show that f maps 1, 2 to itself, f prime of x absolute value is less than 1 for every x in 1, 2. We already seen the visual evidence that f maps from 1, 2 to itself, um, however, we do need to actually formally prove it. Clearly, f of x is 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x, and x is in 1 to 2, so therefore it's positive. f of x must be greater or equal to 1. f is decreasing because we can compute its derivative and c is negative. f prime of x equals to minus 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is negative. Then f of x is less than or equal to f1, and f1 is 1 and 1 half, this is less than or equal to 2, so overall f of x is between 1 and 2, and as a result, f maps from 1, 2 to itself. So the first objective is now accomplished, f maps from 1, 2 to itself. And also we can take the absolute value of the derivative and see it is always less than 1. So therefore, by the proposition f of x is a contraction on the interval 1 to 2 as needed. By the contraction mapping principle CMP, first we know that f has a unique fixed point, x star, in the interval 1 to 2. And second, we know that the sequence xn converges to x star. Going back to how the sequence is defined, we see that the initial value x0 being 1 is also important. It is in the closed interval 1 to 2. So therefore, it satisfies the hypothesis stated in the contraction mapping principle. So now it's just a matter of actually calculating the fixed point, which is a very straightforward algebra problem. So we first set x equals to f of x, and then x is equal to 1 plus 1 over 1 plus x. Multiply 1 plus x on both sides. We get x plus x squared equals to 1 plus x plus 1. Canceling out x on both sides, we get x squared equals 2, and x star is square root of 2, because x star is in the interval 1 to 2. So that's it for today's video. Let me know if you're interested in further applications of the Banach fixed point theorem. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy my content, and I'll see you next time. Bye.